Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to this short session. Tim Baker is my name, and we're going to be spending about 30 minutes together this morning, a very brief session. And we're looking at an interesting topic around recruitment. And our recruitment practices haven't changed much for decades. Uh, you'd be aware, of course, that we use behavioural interviewing techniques when we want to recruit somebody. Now, that makes a lot of sense in a very predictable environment. So often what we do in interviews is we ask people, you know, if they can explain a situation where they had, you know, to do such and such, and that such and such is very much related to the work that the person is being recruited to do. And the argument is if we can see that people have had past experience and they may well be suitable for that opportunity Trouble is, of course, the workplace is changing so quickly that by the time the person settled into the job, the job has changed and the person then has to develop a whole new skill set. So the question about whether to recruit people on past experience or future potential is a very real question. And I'd like to address that one today um, with you. So I'll just share my slides and we'll get stuck into it. So this comes from my book, uh, which is out in a few months' time, The Future of Human Resources, Unlocking Human Potential. And this is one of several issues that I look at in terms of the changes that are necessary for the future. So just a little bit about me in case you don't know who I am. Uh, I, I'm a keynote speaker, I'm an author, and uh, I've written approximately 15 books at this stage. Uh, this one that I'm talking about today is my latest book. You can see that I also am an executive coach and I still play rugby in the Gold Oldies competition here in Brisbane, which is probably a little, little ridiculous at my age, but never mind. We only play every second week just to make sure we recover. <laughs> so that's a bit about me. I won't go on and on, on, but it gives you a bit of a sense of who I am. Now, one of the objections that people would have to a topic like this is that um, isn't behavioural interviewing the best way to select the right candidate for a vacant job? Now, that's a good question. And it has been the conventional way that we select people because if we can find out what people have done in the past and if what they've done in the past is very commensurate with what they need to do in the new job, then it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, that that person who has the best match is the right candidate. But as we all know, and we've just been through COVID or you know, coming out of COVID at least, the world is changing at such a rapid rate that this approach is now becoming fast redundant. And we've got to try a new approach of recruiting. Now, I'm not, please don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting for a minute the past experience isn't important. Of course it is. It will continue to be important. But if we're only selecting people on their past experience, I think we're making a big mistake. And that's where future potential comes in. So let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by future potential because it sounds a little... Um, you know, it's not, it's a bit of a vague term. So what do I actually mean by future potential? And then what do I actually mean? What are the characteristics of future potential? What are some of the things that you should be looking for in the recruitment process to determine whether or not somebody does meet those criteria? And then, of course, I've got a special offer for you at the end of the presentation, which I'll talk about shortly. So let's talk about future potential and what it actually is. But before I do that, my book is based on the employee life cycle. So what I'm looking at is the concept that uh, employees need to, uh, you know, they go through a familiar cycle when they go through any workplace. Normally there's a recruitment and selection process, which of course I'm going to talk about today. And then once they uh, get on board, there's an onboarding and induction process. And normally that person is trained and developed to do their job more effectively. And they're rewarded for doing that. And they're promoted often into other positions uh, if they show some sort of potential. And then of course, 
they we have an exit interview and they depart. Now, those stages aren't likely to change in the future. Uh, the issue is that the average person now spending about just under two years in the same organisation. So what that means, of course, is that this cycle becomes even more important and that we get it right. And so what I do in the book is I talk about some of the mindset shifts that are required in each of these areas in order to get up to speed for HR and for business as, as in general. But I really want to just focus today on that recruitment and selection idea today because uh, we've only got a short time together and I will be covering those other areas in subsequent webinars. So let's look at this whole notion of future potential. Uh, what I would say to you is that all of us um, can spot future potential. It's very easy. If I went into your working environment, say tomorrow, and I sat down with you, uh, not tomorrow, but let's say Monday, and I sat down with you and uh, we just had a little bit of a look at how people were performing their tasks, regardless of it was a, whether it was a skillful task or not, I'll guarantee that you and I would be able to come to the same decision about whether somebody's showing high potential or not. So it's not a mystery. But, of course, when you're recruiting somebody based on high potential, it is a bit of a mystery, particularly if they're candidates that are outside the organisation, because obviously you, don't, you, you haven't seen them you, you, you're only going on what they've written in their CV. Uh, you might have talked to their referees, but you're taking a bit of a punt as to whether or not they do demonstrate future potential. But really, those people that might apply for jobs internally, it's not so difficult, of course, because you've probably got a very good idea about whether they do exhibit some of the qualities that I'm going to talk about about future potential. Okay, so what is future potential? Now, Here's a definition that comes out of my book. Um, I think it's basically how quickly and effectively a person can adapt and respond to changes in their surrounding work environment. Ultimately, to me, that's what it's all about. It's not about whether they're a star performer per se, although I'd have to say to you they'll probably be a star performer if they've got this quality. So it's the ability of a person to be able to adapt quickly and respond to the changes in their working environment. Now, what's the opposite of that? Well, I'm sure we'd all be aware of people in our own organisations who just want to be told what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And as soon as there's any change in a routine or a system, these people get very upset and, you know, they can't cope, they can't adapt. So that's the act, act, absolute opposite of future potential. So we want people who can adapt quickly to change. So if we can find out whether people have that capacity to adapt quickly to change, then we're obviously, in a, you know, we're very much unearthing what future potential is. Now, of course, if in an interview you say to somebody, can you adapt well to change, uh, which is, of course, a closed question, then they're probably going to say yes. But whether they can or not is another question. But that's ultimately what we're aiming to do because the world is changing so quickly. We need people who are resourceful, adaptive. We also need people who are agile. Those are the key qualities we're looking for in this whole area. So let's break that down a little bit and look at it in a bit more detail. Now, some of the X factors, if we can call it that, are these things. So if we're looking at this adaptive behavior, these are some of the things we're looking for. We're looking, for example, for a person that's got a lot of drive to excel, somebody that takes pride in their performance. Because if someone takes pride in their performance, it's often the case where they will adapt quickly so that they can excel. So we're looking for people who have that drive. And that's important. And, and it's not a selfish individual drive either. It's more a drive to help the business, business achieve its own objectives. We want somebody who's hungry to learn. So these people will often accept feedback and not only will they accept it, they'll listen to it 
even if it's constructive or negative feedback, and they have a capacity to be able to take on board the key messages that the person might be sharing with them. They have an entrepreneurial spirit. Now, some of you, of course, are working in the private uh, public sector, and you might say, if we're working in a government environment, we don't really want people to be entrepreneurial. I would disagree with that. I think you actually want people who are entrepreneurial, who are not satisfied with the status quo, that want to look at things, that will question how things are done, why they're done that way, how can they be done better, faster, easier, safer? We want people like that, regardless of whether it's private sector, public sector or not for profit. So I don't think that's confined to the private sector. We also want people who are dynamic sensors, that is they can pick up on cues quickly and adapt both particularly interpersonally and they can work well with other people because ultimately most change is about is as much about processes as it is about people. So there are some of the factors. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that you don't need to go out and reinvent the wheel. You can ask your questions, your behavioural questions around their past experience. I think that's a good starting point. I don't think you should change much there, but don't rely totally on the interview about past experience. Now, you might say, well, hang on, I'm, I'm working in a semi, my business is semi-skilled or, um, you know, it doesn't matter because ultimately you're looking for people who are willing to be adaptive in their environment. And that can be just as applicable in a semi-skilled environment as it is in a highly skilled environment. So we're looking for those things. And what I'm suggesting is that you ask some questions around that. So in other words, you incorporate in bed into your interviews questions around these factors. And I'll share some more factors with you, some more characteristics in a moment. So by doing that and having some thoughtful questions around that, you can unearth whether or not people um, actually do exhibit these traits. Now, the other thing, of course, is referee checks, which I think is hugely underestimated. If you ask the right questions to the referees, uh, you should be able to get a sense or be able to validate what you heard in the interview as well. So it's really about that. Now, there are a number of companies out there now that have uh, these kind of profiles that people can do that can actually measure high potential. Now, I predict that we're going to get more and more of those companies because I believe this is a trend that's inevitable. And I think you're going to find that there are more and more companies now where you can engage their services to do profiles so that you can get a sense of whether people actually have some of these X factors that we're talking about. But ultimately, I think there are basically five key success indicators you're looking for. And if I could find a, and it, you know, if I could find a person that I am engaging, employing, who has these five success factors, then I think that I'm in a very good position. So don't forget, this is over and above their experience. So obviously I'm expecting that they, you know, that they've had some experience doing whatever the work is that you suggest. But I want to be able to see some evidence of these five success factors because ultimately that's what it is. So what I'd be suggesting you do is to craft one or two really good open-ended questions around some of these success factors. That will give you a sense of whether the person actually is going to be able to be adaptable uh, if and when they are engaged or employed in your organisation. So let's go through them and spend a bit of time just talking about each. There's the right motivation. Now, what does the right motivation mean? Well, obviously we want people who are motivated, but there's two different types of motivation. There's a selfish motivation. That's where people are just sort of climbing up the greasy pole and they'll push people aside at any, at any chance they get. That is not the sort of motivation I'm talking about. I'm actually looking for people who are motivated interpersonally as much as personally. In other words, they are striving to achieve 
with and through other people, not just in their own way to get all the glory. So I'm looking for I'm looking for examples of where people have been faced with a challenge, who have been able to work constructively and successfully with people to get the job done. So it might be a challenging project, it could be uh, some work situation where there was automation involved and people had to adapt. I'm looking for those examples because if I can find those examples um, where people are actually cooperating with each other in order to achieve a result. Now you might say, am I talking about leaders here? Not necessarily. I could be talking about employees who are part of a project or a team, but I'm looking for a selfless style of motivation, not a selfish style of motivation. Because obviously we've all, we've all experienced people who are selfish in their motivation and it's highly destructive and doesn't achieve anything in the long run. I'm also looking for people who are curious. Now, what does curious mean? Curious means that they, they want to ask questions. In fact, sometimes they can come across as annoying, but they're willing to ask key questions in order to understand how things work or why they work. I actually want people that will question things because people who ask good questions open up thought processes that will help other people consider how they do their work. A good example of this might be that if you've got a new employee, you could ask them, look, you've been here for a week. Tell me what you've noticed that puzzles you about the way we do our work. That's a good question because obviously what that does is it, is it gives the person an opportunity to talk about some of the things that they've noticed and if they're innately curious, they're likely to have some questions that they're going to put forward. I want people who have insight. Now, insight means that when you're given a, a bunch of data, you can actually make good, uh, thoughtful conclusions from it. Um, so I want people to be able to see more than what's in front of them. And I want people to be able to make judgments based on a range of data and information that they receive. Now, now when I talk about data, I'm not necessarily talking about IT or anything like that. Data, of course, we're all operating with systems and processes. I want people to be able to make independent judgments that are based on good evidence. I also want people who are engaged in their work. Now, we all know that 70% of people are disengaged in their work, which is pretty scary. And worse still, 25% of those people are actively disengaged. In other words, they're attempting to um, undermine the organisation and what they're doing. Um, so what I'm looking for is a level of engagement now, what would be a clever question around that is that when people have been faced with a very challenging and difficult situation, how were they able to maintain their motivation? What did they do? And how did they, how did they sort of get through the exercise, even though it was a great difficulty for them? And, and of course, that, that, that brings us to the final um, success factor, which is determination. I want people to be able to demonstrate to me at the interview that they're determined and determined means that they'll see things through to the end and they won't give up halfway through. So I'm looking for examples. So yes, I can use behavioral interviewing again, but I'm looking for examples of where people are working against the odds who actually achieve success. So I'm looking for that. I want to see evidence of that. If I can see evidence of that, you know, it tells me that under a, an approach where there's obviously going to be some need to adapt, they're going to not throw their hands in the air and give up. So there are the, the, these are the things we're looking for. And as I said to you earlier, I could come into your workplace and we could sit down together with these five things in front of us. And you and I would both agree on who exhibits those traits because it would be very obvious. So of course, when you're recruiting internally, it's a little easier because you can get some sort of assessment about whether people meet those criteria. 
And of course, people outside the workplace, you've got to be a little cleverer about the questions you ask and the examples you seek so that you can see these success factors. But as I said, there are some profiling tools out there that are very, very useful for this as well. Now, um, this gentleman here really just encapsulates exactly what I'm talking about. And I want to read this through because it's a good little quote. Potential is the most important predictor of success at all levels, from junior management to C-suite to the board. So we're talking about right across the organisation. I'm convinced that organisations and their leaders must transition to what I think of as a new era of talent spotting, one in which their evaluations of one another are based not on born brains, experience, or competencies, but on potential. So this sort of sums up my point, and that's what we're looking for right now in our world of work when we're actually recruiting people into new positions. We need to look for this concept of potential. Now, you might say, well, how many people out there actually exhibit these five characteristics we've looked at? And I would say to you, not many. That's the truth of it. There's not many out there. But of course, if you don't ask the right questions, it's likely you'll make mistakes in your recruitment process and regret it later on. So by all means, talk to people about their experience. By all means, determine you know, what they've done in the past and whether that has a reasonable match to what you expect them to do in your job. But don't leave it at that. There's a lot more to it than that. And you know, it's really about those five criteria that I mentioned earlier. Craft some questions around that. And you know, if you may, and there's no problem, you can actually give people these questions in advance. If you feel that, you know, putting people on the spot might be a bit difficult. I just want to see evidence that these five criteria that I've run through are part of their DNA. And if I've got evidence of that, I know I'm making a good decision. And uh, because it means that, of course, when your business changes, and it will inevitably and has and will continue to do so, you have somebody who is able to adapt. And if you've got someone that's able to adapt, they're going to be an asset to your business. And that's ultimately the bottom line of this. So what are the takeaways here? I'd say one takeaway is use diagnostics to measure potential. And you just have to go onto Google and there's a couple of good ones that I mentioned in my book as well that I highly recommend. And just, just check them out and see what they have to offer. Um, because normally we, we don't we, we do personality profiling, we do, you know, we do IQ tests, we do all sorts of things at the recruitment stage. So to add another diagnostic would not be a problem if we did that. Um, but if you didn't want to go down that road, it's not a problem. All you need to do is to ask questions at the interview and to the referees that are based on future potential. So I've given you the five ingredients in that. All you've got to do is craft some questions around that. And if you can do that, what you're going to do is you're going to actually determine whether or not that person would be classified as high potential. Now, the other thing I'd suggest is that you offer L&D programs to foster the, attri the attributes of, uh, of of future potential. So your workplace, I'm not sure how it operates, but you should try to incorporate some programs in there that really promote the things that I've been talking about. Because obviously you're trying to grow potential internally as well as recruit externally as well. So I think your L&D learning and development program should foster that as well. So they're the takeaways, folks. And uh, if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, drop, drop me an email. I'm happy to respond to those questions. No problem at all. What I would say just before we finish up is that next week I'm going to talk about hybrid working. Now, hybrid working, I believe, is here to stay. Basically, you know, we have been moving towards a remote 
environment for a long time. Now, I know some of the work that you do, people have to be on site, I get that. But not all office workers uh, necessarily have to be on, on site. And I believe hybrid working, that is working in the office and at, and at home, is now something that is permanent. And therefore, I want to look next week at the challenges and opportunities of that uh, that offers. And uh, so, you know, there you go. The link is at the bottom. You just have to click on that link and it'll take you into that. Uh, yeah, you'll be registered just as you did today for that topic. So remember, every Friday I have one of these topics that goes for about 30 minutes. And finally, I have a special offer for you, and that is my book's coming out in a couple of months. If you'd like a copy of the future of human resources, unlocking human potential, uh, just send me an email and I will be able to give you that for half the price plus postage. And uh, it's, I think it's advertised now on Amazon, but it's not available, but it will be, I'll be receiving a batch of them as soon as the publisher's ready to go. And I'll send you a copy, I'll sign it and uh, away you go. So that's my little offer for you today. So you just have to send me an email by close of business today. I'll register you and away we go. So that's it for me, folks. Um, I'm done. So I'll be sending you a copy of the slides and the recording. And you'll get a copy of that fairly soon. So check your inbox. I've also got a number of other interesting topics coming up over the next few weeks. And you might like to have a look at those topics as well. Um, thank you, Craig. I always enjoy your feedback. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice. It's, it just indicates that I might be doing something right here. So thank you. Um, so I look forward to catching up uh, next week. And uh, thank you, everyone. All the best. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll catch you, hopefully, next Friday. Thank you and goodbye.